It's time for the double stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to the Double Stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week on the show, I have producer, engineer, mixer Dave Jordan. And before I go to the interview, I really got to say, this one is a riot. I have a bit of a running joke with some of my friends that in all my best interviews, I say very little. The less I have to talk, the better the interview is. And this one is a classic example. Before the interview took place, Dave took the time to check out the show and actually listen to some of the interviews. So he knew exactly what I was going for and what I'm trying to accomplish with this show. So when the call happened, he just went off. And it was awesome. So this week is pretty much a first-person account of the life and career of Dave Jordan, a producer who has worked with a range of artists that include Frank Zappa and Herbie Hancock to Alice in Chains and Jane's Addiction. And my own little obsession for regular listeners of the show, the ill-fated Violet's Demise album, which he produced. The album with Rowan Robertson and Odie Logan. So we'll hear about that as well. So here it is, Dave Jordan talking all about his life and career. So I'm from uh, originally from the uh, Seattle area, and then my family moved down here when I was five years old. My father was a musician, and uh, uh, so I grew up in a musical family. And um, he actually uh, started taking me to recording sessions here in Los Angeles when I was like in junior high school. When I was about oh, 12, 13 years old, he started taking me to sessions. And it was about the age of 14, I got started my first band. And uh, so um, my dad taught me a lot. You know, I learned about microphones. In fact, he taught me how to uh, solder microphone cables, XLR cables, when I was like uh, eight <laughs> years old. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I played in bands. Uh, I, I always had good equipment, so I got in, played in bands better than in my ability to play, but I had PA system and I had microphones and um, I had a, a good bass rig. And uh, so, and, and then from there, uh, in the, uh, I played in bands until the uh, early 70s and then um, I uh, went to a recording school. A friend of mine had gone to a recording school and so uh, 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 Eddie Schreier, he became a mastering engineer. He ended up mastering all my records. And Eddie was in the bands I was in. So he played guitar in the bands I was in. So he said, you know, um, you know, my, I wasn't doing anything. Music, I wasn't making any money. So and he was making money mastering. He was working at MCA. So um, originally I was going to be a mastering engineer like Eddie. And um, so I was going... Yeah, I was going to the school and I was going over to Whitney and he was teaching me mastering at night. And uh, then I got a call from a friend of mine that was in uh, a band that I was in, a glass band I was in, and he was building a studio. And the studio was was where, it was out in Chatsworth, California, is where um, Speedy Dan recorded their album, Katie Lied. It was in a barn. So we took over the barn and uh, built a studio in there. It was called Smoke Tree. So that's actually where I began. Um, I finished the school. I was working at Smoke Tree. And uh, at that time, we, we got what was called an equipment package. It was a lease package. It was the first lease package that I was aware of where you could get a board, tape machine. It was MCI. So we got an MCI 500 console and tape machine. So this, this was like 1977. So, um, so then uh, I, I worked there for a year. And uh, from there, I went to a studio, a small studio called Redondo Pacific in um, Redondo Beach. And that sold at that studio. It was on his last legs when I went there. So then I, I got a call. I'd been written up in REP magazine, Recording Engineer Producer magazine, as the guy that knew how to run these MCI consoles because they were computerized boards in the 70s were a brand new thing. And so, um, so um, the studio owner was in Hollywood. Hal Zeiger, who uh, owned uh, El Dorado Studio, which was an old recording studio in Hollywood that was built for doing rock and roll, along with uh, Gold Star. Anyway, he, he hired me because I knew how to run that board. So we installed that board. And um, actually, actually, when my career started off was at uh, El Dorado. 
And I'd worked there for about a year when uh, Brian Eno came in the door. And I put an advertisement in a magazine, Mix Magazine, saying that we had a Lexicon 224 digital reverb, which we did not. But I wanted to get one. I actually, I lied. And he came to look at it. And um, uh, we, and so I called this friend of mine, Ice and Allen. He, he was an equipment broker who would put the equipment in at Smoke Tree. And I said, can you get me a, a, the Flexicon 224 digital reverb? Brian Eno is coming in. He wants to look at it. So he said... Well, there's one coming into town going to Village Recorders, and I can let you borrow it. And so um, I got that. He dropped that machine off like about nine o'clock in the morning, and Brian came in about noon. And in the interim period, three hours, I learned how to use it. And so when he came in, I acted like I was an old hand. (laughs) I knew the thing really well. And he brought some cassette tapes with him. And I put him up on the board and ran him through the reverb, and also ran him through. I had a, um, a Harmonizer 910. And uh, I just I had some rudimentary. I had really good mics at that studio, and I had really good compressors. But I didn't have much outboard gear as far as like toys. I had a harmonizer. I had a um, um, a digital delay unit. Uh, I forget what it was. It was a very simple digital delay unit at the time, and um, that was about it. I mean, I had some key packs and uh, that just came in. So with the T-Pexes, I showed him, uh, I took his stuff, his cassettes, and I was showing him how you could, uh, you know, uh, put one sound in and trigger it with another sound and, and stuff like that. And that was actually, uh, he actually booked the studio for nine weeks. He brought David Byrne out, and we did My Life of the Bush and Ghost. And that album was incredibly interesting to work on because um, there was no samplers at this time, no MIDI. And um, everything was done by hand. It was real loops, uh, real everything. And it was all handmade album. And I, I just listened to that album yesterday. I hadn't listened to it in years. And that album still holds up. In fact, I think it's better now than it was then because uh, everybody had a hand to trying to do this kind of stuff, these found sounds and all this kind of stuff. And when I mean found sounds, I mean, we didn't use real drum sets. I made a drum set with, uh, with a kick drum made out of a cardboard box and I, I forget what I use for a snare, but for toms, we use cleanser cans and uh, tune them. I mean, everything was done. The whole idea of making the album was we used real guitars and we used a real bass, but everything else, all the sounds on that album were pretty much out, sounds that I came up with and invented in the studio. And there were sounds that uh, never existed before and that haven't existed since because there's no way of... of you know, sampling them or anything like that. But they're really interesting sounds on that record. Anyway, from there, uh, uh, we finished the record, and then a couple months later, I got a call from Brian, you know, and he was down in the uh, Bahamas, wanted to know if I wanted to come down and do uh, the Talking Heads album. And I said, fuck yeah. So got on a plane, went down to the Bahamas, and uh, did Remain in Light. It started it there, then we went to New York and finished that record. And I was off and running after that. I mean, I, the phone didn't stop ringing after that. Um, after that, um, I worked with Frank Zappa. Uh, uh, Frank Zappa called me up. And he said his engineer had been injured and wanted to know if I wanted to work for him. And uh, he'd actually, co- he was looking for an engineer and he called Hal. The guy had hired me. Hal Zagger had been in the business for years. And uh, Hal suggested me, so um, uh, Hal lo- loaned me out to Frank Zappa, so I went work for him for a while. And then uh, did he have Steve Vai in his band at that point? Yeah, yeah. Steve Vai had just come in. Steve Vai was still doing transcripts at that time. Yeah, he, uh, he, right. he hired Steve Steve Vai to do uh, to take his the solos that he did in concert and transcribe them. How uh, Frank was incredibly interested to work with. He always had something going on. I did an album when I was there with him, but I did a bunch of other stuff with him too. Um, uh, I transcribed, not transcribed, but I um, redid his first six albums. Um, he got he had gotten his catalog back from Warner Brothers, and uh, and he's putting it out on his own label, Barking Pumpkin. And I redid, uh, re-cued, and remastered his. Um, first uh, six albums for him. And I worked on a film called Baby Snakes, and uh, um, there was always something going on. I mean, I, it was funny, when you showed up to work at Frank's place, uh, he had a time clock, like in a factory, and I had a time card with my name on it, and I'd punch in and out, and I'd punch out to go to lunch. You know? and, oh, but, really? Um, 
but how I got the job was interesting. He had a um, song that he said he wanted finished, but he said it had been considered unmixable. And it was a song called What's New in Baltimore? And it was a, a song consisting of uh, live uh, live concert takes and um, edited in with studio takes. And what, what I found when I started mixing it, what was inconsistent and hard was the drum sound change you know, from take to take. And that's the reason it was considered unmixable. And remember, at this time, there's no samplers or anything like that. So what I did, so Frank, Frank, I used to get there at, at uh, you know, in the afternoon, 3 o'clock or something, start working. And Frank would get, start work with me till about, you know, 10 o'clock at night. And then he'd go to sleep. And then I'd still be working when he woke up about 6 in the morning. And then we'd work till about 10 in the morning, you know. So I worked long hours there. But while he was sleeping, what I did was he had kind of crank and tons of equipment. So um, he had, you know, not only instruments, but, you know, uh, speakers, microphones, whatever. So what I did was I took the um, setup, uh, you know, I put up a kick drum, toms, and snare. And what I did is I sent the sounds out. Uh, like the snare on the tape, you know, going from studio uh, to live takes. And I had a, uh, had a trigger into a, um, had a play the snare, for instance. I, I, I dated all the drums and one at a time. I redid the snare, the toms, everything. And, and I made a consistent drum sound and then I mixed it. And when he came in and woke up in the morning, I just hit play. And I said, tell me yes or no. And he said, he, he was astounded. He said that was the first time anybody had been able to mix that thing. And then I took him out into the studio and I showed him what I did. And all the mics and speakers and drum set was still set up. And uh, he called up, uh, I remember he called up REP magazine. I think it was REP at the time. And he brought him in and he says, look at what we're doing here, you know, at my studio. You know, like, you know, like, <laughs> you know I, he was so proud of the fact that, you know, I, you know, I, I had the idea for sampling years ago, you know, if you could take the sounds and capture them. And how I made my first sampler was I actually took a DMX drum machine that would hold sound, and I made up a Molex connector, and I actually had a crude sampler in that thing where I could replace the sounds that were on the drum machine with my own sounds. And then um, Andy Harper, this Australian guy that I knew, uh, brought in, uh, he was working with the Ice House, the band that I was working with, I'd worked with before. And uh, he stopped by the studio to meet me because I'd worked on Ice House. And uh, he had that machine with me. And I said, what is it? He had it under his arm. And I said, what's that? And he says, AMS sampler, or AMS delay unit, and it also does sampling. And I said, you're, sh- you're shitting me. So um, he got me one of those. I bought one. And um, immediately after that, I worked with uh, Herbie Hancock on the, uh, and I did uh, an album with him, and um, it had a huge hit on called Rocket. And everything on there was samples that I did. Um, it was like, like the producer Bill Lazo and Michael Beinhardt would say, you know, it'd be great right here to have like the crunch of like Jimmy Page's guitar, you know. And I said, well, I can do that. So I nicked off like sounds like Jimmy Page hitting the car. <laughs> You know that which is on Rocket, and um, uh, I mixed a bunch of sounds off of records and stuff, and made that record. And you know because I had this this training from doing my life in the bush of ghosts, so now I just updated it with using samples. And um, I was actually there was this uh, lawyer that got in contact with me after I did that record because uh, this whole thing with sampling was a new thing. And uh, he interviewed me, and I was written up in the California law books on sampling, what I considered to be something that would be licensable or something that would be free. And um, what I remember saying at the time that I thought that uh, any sound that's a one shot should be free, but if it's recognizable, in other words, it goes for you know a few seconds or more. You know, like uh, when Vanilla Ice used dum 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 da da dum dum, you know, off of yeah, uh, yeah. Queen. Yeah, I, something like that would, to me would be licensable because, you know, they, they, and um, I've been involved over the years in court cases where people have nicked off uh, uh, samples and then I go to court and I show how they actually, you know, they claim that they came up with the sounds themselves and I show them how they didn't in court. <laughs> <laughs> 
And how I do it is I bring in my computer and I bring in logic. Uh, I have logic on sure. my computer. And what I do is I use, take two waveforms, take their waveform and the original waveform, and I show them how it was, you know, even though they put reverb on it and they tried to mask the sound, that the actual basic uh, waveform is the same. And, um, and usually uh, what's mixed off is stuff that's being played, like guitar parts or whatever, you know, bass parts. And I show them in court, like, two, no two human beings can play the same part exactly the same way. And I've learned that in engineering. You just can't, you know, if I'm going to double guitars, for instance, I can either spend endless hours having the second guitar player try to play exactly what the first guitar player did, or I can just have this, the first guitar player just double himself, which is much easier. You know, no two players play the same. So, um you know, I, I, I haven't lost a court case yet, you know. So, but um, all this came back. I, I've always been, ever since I was a kid, I've been interested in sound. Uh, my dad, when I was like about eight years old, he bought me a one sack tape recorder. And I used to, I learned how to uh, record and edit on that thing. I got really good at editing on tape. I, to this day, I can edit really well on tape. And um, in fact, I just bought a 24 track machine again. Um, I, oh, really? I have a 24 track machine and I have a, a two track machine. Two track machine is, a, is an Ampex ATR with one inch heads, half inch per track that I mix to. And then I, I have a, uh, a Studer 827 with Ampex playback electronics. And it's the only one in the world. And it sounds fantastic. I never thought the Studer 827 sounded that good on the playback. They were softer sounding than the 800 Studers. But the Ampex, my favorite machine of all times was the Ampex 1200, which I had at El Dorado. And um, I'd had that thing rebuilt, and that was my favorite sounding machine. So I, I had this machine built with um, Ampex playback electronics. So um, I'm still using tape. I mean, what I do is I record basics on 24 track, and then I, I put them on Pro Tools and do overdubs like vocals and stuff, which is much easier to do on Pro Tools and with editing and stuff. And, and then I then I mix back the tape. Are a lot of bands looking to record on tape now? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's very popular. It's very popular right now. Um, there's, uh, you know, I mean, the, the bands come to me and they say the same thing. Their favorite records from the '70s or whatever were recorded on tape, and they said, you know, whatever whatever arguments there are for or against uh, digital, still the evidence is there that their favorite records were recorded on tape. And, you know, for me, um, I understand all the good parts and bad parts of both, of analog and digital. And I'm not one to say one's better than the other, but I do know the strengths and the weaknesses of both sound-wise for me. I think the low end on, on analog sounds better, warmer on um, tape. I think where digital really shines is the ability to capture a sound and it always stays there exactly the same way. And um, I do find sonically that I do like the mid-range of digital. Um, so, I mean, I, I use a combination of things when I record analog and digital equipment and I, I use it in a way that, you know, sonically pleasing to me. Um, the board I use at the studio is, uh, I've, I've worked on a number of different boards over the years. I've worked on them all probably. It, 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 like Frank Zappa had a Harrison board, for instance. And uh, I, I actually learned how to use the SSL board in England. Um, George Martin showed me the SSL board um, in 1984. So, um, you know, I, and I, when I came back to the United States, I was all SSL guy. I, you know, and up to that point, I'd been a need guy because we had gotten a need board at uh, El Dorado. But um, uh, you know, and today I have a need board. You know, so I, and I bet I still mix. I, I mix some things on need, and I mix some things on SSL. But um, it depends on the project that I'm doing and the sound that I'm going for. Um, but, you know, I know know the equipment and sonically what it does so well that I can pick and choose what I want to use. I mean, um, but anyway, I'll, I'll go back to where I left off in my career. So I, I did this Herbie Hancock record, and um, uh, that that put me in a whole new direction. Um, I I got a, actually got a call from Mick Jagger. He hunted me down and wanted to know if I wanted to come down to the Bahamas and work on a record um, that. Uh, it wasn't a record, actually. It was just he said he had Jeff back, uh, 
Jan Hammer, um, um, this guy from Santana, the, the original drummer from Santana, Mike Shreve. Um, uh, there was Tom Peterson from Cheap Trick. He had different... <laughs> wow. And, yeah, and you want to know if I want to come down and record him. You know, he was just playing around, and uh, it, it wasn't meant to be a solo record at that time. But anyway, I went down there with Bill Laszlo, uh, and uh, Bill Laszlo was producing it. And uh, so I started working with Mick Jagger, and then it turned out to be a record, and I spent a year working on that. And then uh, when I got done with that, I got a call from Mick again, uh, I was in New York just finishing his record and I was leaving for the airport and I got a call and it was Mick and wanted to know if I wanted to come to Paris and work with the Stones. And again, I said, fuck yeah. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, I always say, yeah, I never say no. I mean, I, I just dive right in there, you know? And, um, so, um, I, uh, went off to Paris and then worked with the Stones. Now, there was a big battle at the time going on between Keith and Mick over the... Actually, it was the whole band against Mick because he'd done a solo record. And uh, before, they just got signed to a new label, uh, uh, Columbia, and uh, they wanted their first record to be a Rolling Stones record. And, uh, and I explained to Keith, I said, listen... You know, it didn't. It wasn't in Mick's mind. I mean, the way it was presented to me, it wasn't supposed to be a solo record. It was, uh, how it became a solo record was I was in New York working. Uh, no, I was in London working on the record, and I got a call from Walter Yenikoff, and Walter wanted to know if there's anything that he could hear. So the, the the track that was the most developed at the time. Now Mick wasn't even there. Mick was in France on his vacation. So I was in uh, London working by myself with another guy, uh, Ron Madness. He was a keyboard player that I knew from Los Angeles, and he happened to be living in London now. So him and I were working on Just Another Night. And uh, so I, I sent uh, Wally Yannikoff Just Another Night, and all of a sudden it became a solo record, and that was the first single. So, you know, I explained to him, it was just a matter of step by step, and I said, if anybody's to blame, it's me, because I told Walter that we had a record going here, you know? So... Uh, Anyway, it, it, of course, they did, it, it, me saying that did nothing. He still, him and Mick still fought, and they fought through the whole record. But, um, you know, that was a crazy record to do, and uh, I worked on that another year. Um, it took a year to do, and then uh, we worked in Paris for six months and worked in New York for six months. And then when I got done with that, I came back to Los Angeles, and I was fried at that point after working on that record. And I took a couple months off, and I... I told my manager, I said, you know something, I'm just bored now, just engineering. And uh, he says, well, why don't you go back to a place where you started, where you were happy, when you were working with local bands and all that stuff. So I said, yeah, let's just find a small band for me to work with. And, you know, instead of working on these big major productions, let me work on something that, you know, I can have fun with. Of course, the, the uh, first one came up with Jane's Addiction. And that turned out to be a big fucking hit. Right after that was Social Distortion. In one year, I did um, uh, Jane's Addiction, Social Distortion's first record, and Alice in Chains' first record. So, I, you know, all of a sudden, I was in the heat of the battle again, you know, as, you know, as, as a producer now, not as an engineer. I was, I was engineering all my records still. I'd, um, in 1990, I hired Byron Carlstrom to work with me as an engineer. So him and I were engineering together. I still... Uh, all my records, I get the basic track sounds. You know, I get the you know get the drum sound, the bass sound, the guitar basic sound. So I want to make sure what what I'm I, I carve the record basically, and then I work with an engineer. I, today I do the same thing. I work with a guy named Ivan Wayman, um, great kid, he's 25 years old, real rock and roll engineer, and uh, him and I just finished a work a couple records together. But um, anyway, so. You know, we work together engineering, and then I mix. I, I'm I'm happy to say I've mixed every record I've ever ever produced or or engineered. Um, so um, I've had tons of experience in in engineering, production, and uh, mixing. So um, and as far as which ones I like to do the best, um, I think probably mixing is my favorite thing to do. I like cutting basic tracks too. I, there's something about cutting basic tracks that's a lot of fun for me because it could be anything. You know, and, and if it's supposed to be something, you know, a certain sound or whatever, then it's a challenge for me to get that sound. 
but I like doing basic tracks and I like doing uh, mixing. Um, doing overdubs, it's up and down, you know. It can be a lot of fun or it can just be boring as hell. But um, uh, What about the producing side? Or is that just babysitting? Well, what it's two different hats, engineering and producing. Now, when you're engineering, you know, I had to learn how to produce. I had to learn that the snare sound isn't the most important thing on the record, you know? <laughs> I had to, yeah, that's true. I, yeah. I had to... I had and I had to learn that putting everything in little boxes and making sure everything is nice and clean and you know organized to the nth degree can be a detriment to the record because all of a sudden you, you can make the record sound stiff. I had to learn how to get things you know get juice in the record and get and and look at the song and look at the, uh, what the artist is and strip away everything the artist is not and trying to focus on on what they they are. I mean, that's production. That's what a producer should do. Engineering is uh, making sure everything is nice and uh, clear as far as what's going on. And production is making sure everything is nice and messy so something great comes out of it. <laughs> I mean, that's what I learned from uh, Brian Eno working with him, like on my good life, Wish Ghost, and, and working on uh, Remain in Light was, I mean, he. I, I would say Brian Eno had the biggest influence on me. Um, him... Um, um, and Bill Laswell and um, Frank Zappa had the biggest influences on me as far as production technique. And um, and work with Bill Laswell, he was he worked like Brian Eno pretty much. And, you know, it can be anything. Um, you know, um, so many people I work with say it has to be this, it has to be that. And I always try to, to introduce the idea that it can be anything. You know, um, the only way that you can have... You know, I mean, my goal as a producer is to make sure that when people hear my stuff on the radio, that it sounds different, that it doesn't sound the same. I'm not trying to copy anybody. I don't want to copy anybody. And, you know, I've, I've, I've been credited with the fact that I changed the sound of hard rock. You know, um, when I did, uh, you know, after I did um, the James Addiction, Alice, well, during the Alice in Chains time, that I started to develop this guitar sound, this heavy guitar sound. And this guitar sound went into the Anthrax record I did. And I even had Gene Simmons come to me from Kiss, and he asked me, how do you get these guitar sounds? They're totally different than what's going on, you know? And uh, um, so, uh, you know, to me, I mean, my, my whole thing with guitar sounds was philosophically and sonically just, just as simple. I know that everybody loves their own, no matter how shitty it is, people like their own home stereo unit. They know it. And they know their own speakers that they're listening to. And what I wanted to do is make, make the guitar sound like they were plugged into your speaker. They weren't, they weren't like my uh, guitar amp mic, you know, and thinned out and compressed. They just sound like they were plugged straight into your speaker. And uh, that's the sound I like. It's, it's like a really natural sound, big sound, instead of... Uh, you know, as opposed to, let's say, like Boston, the band Boston, where they had sure. that. They, I remember when that song came out, More Than a Ceiling, everything changed. You know, all of a sudden you had these thinned out guitar sounds and these real processed guitar sounds. And, um, and. Was that a Rockman? I, you know, was that, that had that sound? A yeah, Rockman? yeah. That, it was that yeah. Rockman, that real Rockman sterile sound. And um, the sound that I like is more like Mountain, you know. And, um, oh, right. you know, like, you know, like heavy, I mean, I love that heavy sound. Brian May from Queen, I love his sound. Um, sounds that are, you know, fat. Um, and I still go for those sounds. I just did an album with a band called The Shrine, and the guitar sounds are fucking viciously lethal on this, this, this record. And, um, uh, you know, so, you know, and I still use Marshall amps and, uh, you know, the right guitars and this, this, this shrine album I just did, I use a Gibson SG and, um, and the guitar player had a, a, a Univox guitar, which is modeled after a Les Paul that sounded awesome. Um, it had a real articulation to it besides the distortion. So, um, you know, so I, so I used his guitar and I used uh, my SG and, uh, some other guitars, but, um, primarily, um, for that fast sound. So going back to the Alice in Chains time, uh, you know, um, when when I got presented with Alice in Chains, there was a tape going around that had 30 songs on it from this new band, Alice in Chains, that just got signed to uh, Sony, one of the Sony labels, Columbia. 
And uh, Nick Terzo had this tape, and he'd already given it to people like Tom Worman and other people, and they all passed on it. Rick Rubin passed on it. Everybody passed on it but me. And there was one song on it was well the tape was all over the place. It was it was punk, glam, uh, pop, and you know it was hard to tell where they were coming from. But there was one song on it, and I can't remember the name of the song now. And uh, it, that I developed help with Jerry develop this whole Alice in Chains sound. And basically the sound was I'm a huge Tony Iommi fan. I always loved Black Sabbath. And, um, you know, Metallica basically sped up Tony Iommi, and that one song slowed Tony Iommi back down to where it should be for me, you know, that half set drop D song. So um, so we developed that whole, we, we sent them back in the, twice. Nick and I sent them back into the re, uh, recording studio to work up demos based around that sound. And uh, that that's that the first record, the sound was developing, and by the time Dirt came out, then it was fully developed, that what we call the Alice in Chain sound. Uh, you know, when that record came out, the Alice in Chain sound, the first, that sound with the bluesy voice and the heavy guitars, you know, rock stations wouldn't play it. They said it was too different. Yeah, I had the same problem with, I've had that problem with a lot of my records, that stations won't play it because it sounds too different. But um, the, the only way you can make a mark is you have to have something different. If you're trying to copy people and, and get their sound, I get hit all the time by people that are Alex and Chains, you know, people in bands that have bands, and they sound just like Alex and Chains, and they want me to produce them. And I say no. You know, I, I did Alex and Chains. I did the real thing. You know, no matter how great you are, it's always going to be, you know, uh, second second to that. Just try something new, you know. So, um it's even I work at the shrine, they're doing something brand new rock to me, which is crazy. Um, but um, so anyway, uh, you know, I've always had this, you know, when I did the first uh, James Addiction record, I got a call from this guy at uh, Warner Brothers telling me, you know, there's nothing like this out on the radio right now. We don't know what we're going to do with it. And I said, I know what to do with it. Put it out. I said, let's, <laughs> let's let it find this audience. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's a problem I have with that, that virus demise. Tell me the story of that. How did you get involved in that band? Because it's become quite legendary, those recordings, for cult classicness. That was such a good album. And uh, that was during a time when Atlantic was going. I just got hired at Atlantic. In fact, they got hired at Atlantic when, they, when I was making that record. And they didn't put it out. That was only the president wouldn't put it out. Because the big hitter on the label was, um, uh, oh, what's the name of it? it, it that Hootie and the Blowfish, it was like Atlantic had take, to me had just taken a crash. So anyway, yeah, that was a good record. I got involved with them. I got approached by um, the A and R guy at Atlantic that turned me on to the band, and um, I can't remember um, Mark Williams. Or, well, I can't remember his name, but anyway, he turned me on to, uh, and I met with uh, Rowan and Oni. And uh, they seemed like really cool guys. Early on, he was like a legend on guitar because, you know, because of Dio and all that. And uh, amazing, just amazing, cool, cool guy and great guitar player. And um, so uh, we recorded that over at Cherokee Studios in Hollywood. And uh, yeah, I thought that there were songs on that, that album that were epic sounding, just epic sounding and uh we never actually got the thing done though properly because uh, you know um Falazoli put he says i'm not putting this out you know and so we never got to the final mixes of the record and uh the the record exists someplace i i have a a, a store room it's full of uh uh it's not the storeroom isn't under my control now. It's under somebody else's control. That it was one. It was a Netflix Nero who worked with me, who ended up with with a bunch of uh, my stuff. And anyway, that tape, the Valve Demise, uh, Dat, is in the storeroom someplace. So that album is still there. If I got the Dat back, we can put it out. It's pretty amazing, actually. It, it, it's really fat juicy sounding and it's like got epic songs on it yeah it doesn't sound it doesn't sound like anything else like uh, further to your point from earlier it doesn't sound like anything else 
No, if we put that record out today, it could probably do something. But but yeah, I never tried to make records. I made a lot of records like that, by the way, that didn't come out. That I know, well, they came out, but they just got lost or whatever. You know, they were noticed. And I listen to them today, and they're as good as anything that I've done. You know, I've done records that I thought were fantastic. They didn't do anything, you know. So, I mean, and, and the Violet the Mice thing was one of them. You know, I did a lot of rock stuff uh, over the years that, uh, you know, demos of bands and things that were really great. And just uh, There was this band uh, back in the um, 80s called, uh, late 80s, called Daisy Chamber. And... Uh, uh, fucking fantastic man and uh never came out that that band was turned on to me by nigel harrison who was a and r over at capital he was the bass player in bondi and he turned me on to this band there was another band called knights of the living dead fucking fantastic recording and didn't do anything i did never got never got released or anything um knights of the living dead was a fucking awesome sounding record um uh, but um I don't know. Uh, the Daisy Chain, Night's the Living Dead, and By Some Eyes are the ones that got away that I thought could have been as big as anything that I did, uh, did with Dallas and Chains or anybody else. Now, what about Anthrax? That was an interesting record you did at an interesting time with uh, them having John Bush on vocals. Yeah, well, I'd worked with John Bush on um, uh, Anthrax, I mean, Armin Saint record, and then uh, uh, so I had nothing to do with it, but they, uh, they, that Armin Saint record I did was Symbol of Salvation was like metal record of the year and like Lars loved it. He came by the studio to, to check it out. And, you know, while we were mixing it, I guess he came by and uh, he was an Armin Saint fan. And uh, there, a lot of people in the metal world loved John Bush and loved Armin Saint. And uh, so when, when the singer from uh, Anthrax was kicked out, the first choice was John Bush. And John Bush is just a really nice guy. I mean, he's a really nice guy, you know. I mean, he's not, a little, he's not like a, some fucking idiot, you know, that thinks he's a rock star. I mean, this guy can really deliver, and he's a nice guy on top of it, but fantastic singer. So, yeah, we did that record. Um, when was it? That was 1994, 5, something. 93, is that what I did? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and... Uh, but yeah, that was a transitional record. I, I did a record like that with a band called Biohazard, too, where they switched singers. So where they kicked the singer out, and the, one of the guys in the band took over. And the record didn't do that good, because they because their audience, the Anthrax, the Anthrax album didn't do as good as what they expected, because the old audience wasn't quite ready for John Bush, uh, is the feedback I got. Even though it was great as he sang, they, yeah, and I remember when I was a kid and I'd buy records and they tra- change singers and bands and stuff. And I, I'd go, wait a minute, you know, you know, I always like the original band better for no matter, even if the new band is better, you know, I still like the original band. So, so, um, so I can understand that. And that, that happened to me in two records, Biohazard and Anthrax, where uh, they changed singers on me and the records didn't do as well as they thought it would. The record did well. I mean, it, you know, it did, did platinum a couple times platinum, but they thought it was going to do like 10 times platinum or something like that. So I don't know what their expectations were. Um, I, I just listened, I listened to that record a few months ago and that's a good record. I mean, there's some good songs on that thing. It's such an interesting blend of, of that era for you because you had bands like Alice in Chains and Red Hot Chili Peppers, whatnot, but you also had Armored Saint and Anthrax and Sacred Reich. Like you had these bands that were, so heavy, and then you know the the early stages of grunge as well, and you're bouncing between them. Yeah, well, what I was, you know, the reason I work with bands like uh, Armored Saint and Sacred Reich and those bands is because I used to play in those kind of bands. The, the, when I was, if you want to know musically what I was doing, that's the kind of band that I was playing with ah, in the right. late '60s, early '70s. So, I mean, so all I was going back to was kind of my roots, you know, joining. You know, when I produce a band, it's like joining the band for a minute. And so, you know, I'd, I'd find these bands that I'd, you know, it's like, you know, I would do this kind of music myself. This is the kind of stuff I would play. You know, so that's the reason I do those kind of bands. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm always looking for something, you know, something a little bit different, too. Um, well, it, it, it's not like, I can't fairly say that I'm looking for something like my criteria is it has to be different. 
my criteria is it has to have a twist on it, is the way I put it. I mean, uh, like Alice in Chains had a twist on it. I mean, there's something about it that that's dark and evil about it, you know, you know, you know, I mean, to me, rock and roll should have like this dangerous quality to it, you know, instead of like Pat Benatar, you know, when she did <laughs> time is a, uh, love is a battlefield. We are so- I mean, what the fuck is that? You know, it's like, <laughs> is that supposed to be hard rock? Love is a battlefield. You know, that's the kind of rock I hate, you know? And then when these hair bands came out during the uh, 80s, you know, to me, that wasn't like real rock and roll. It was all about, you know, it was like bad versions of New York Dolls, you know, uh, with, the, with the makeup and all that bullshit, you know? I mean, um, I, never th- I never thought those bands were any good. Uh, I didn't like the way they sounded, and I and I and I thought they were just for kids, you know, like uh, you know, stonewash Gene crowd, you know, and kind of the uh, kind of the the San Fernando Valley crowd, you know. I don't know how to put it. I grew up there. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, and, and uh, it, it it you know, there's no clubs out here. You know, I still live in the San Fernando Valley. And there's no clubs out here. There's no, they never, but I'll tell you in the San Fernando Valley in the sixties, a lot of great bands came out of, out of, uh, San Fernando Valley. Like, uh, you know, that song, uh, that, that, um, Incense of Peppermints. Remember that song, uh, but Strawberry Longcock, Strawberry Longcock, the Sandells. There was a lot of fucking great bands that were coming out of the Valley at the time during the garage, kind of the garage band psychedelia thing, you know, um, um, electric prunes. Um, I went to high school with this guy, one of the guys in electric prunes. And, uh, you know, they, they, there was a lot of cool bands happening at the time. So uh, there was no, but, but paradoxically, there was no real great clubs out here. There, the clubs out here were kind of these uh, clubs that, uh, which they have in Hollywood now, which is almost pay to play, you know back then, which was, you know, bring your own crowd, you know, so they'll buy drinks, you know, and that, yeah, no, not, no real musical scene behind them. We're out in Hollywood and, uh, Silver Lake Echo Park, they have scenes going on, you know, even to this day of in Venice. I mean, there's a scene happening in Venice, California. Now that's quite on the spot in the shrine. And, uh, um, the, the shrine comes out of that, uh, the, you know, the, uh, skate punk thing, um, I mean, the Shrine is the best blend I've ever found of punk, trash, and hard rock, and uh, and they do it really well. And um, but they, they they come out of that Thrasher magazine type of scene, or and it's like the um, skateboarders out here in Los Angeles are nuts. And they're just fucking full gonzo on, <laughs> full on nuts. They're, they're crazier than any other scene I've ever seen, you know. And a lot of the shows that I go to aren't a club. In fact, I don't go to any clubs uh, here. What I go to is like uh, in uh, warehouses downtown and see bands play. And uh, that's where you see the good bands play. That's where I saw the Shrine play. And, uh, you know, so I, I go to like these uh, one night scenes that, that that are going on down here and, and the fucking crazy ass bands playing. I mean, just fucking full on. So I, what I want to do is, is um, I just did this band, uh, Shrine, with Mike Gitter at uh, Century Records. We got them signed to Century. So Mike Gitter's a really cool guy, and he's way into the scene. So um, I'm going to try to get him to do some of these other bands. Um, you know, there's, there's been a reinsurgence of punk music. You know, there's a lot of bands like the Misfits and stuff that are playing again. Um, but um, but I, I want to get into dig into some of these original skate punk bands. I love that kind of music. It's got so much fucking energy. You know, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for, I'm not looking for stuff that's, that's what I will. First of all, I, I don't care what people call commercial. You know, I'm not somebody that picks my projects by how much money it's going to make me. Fuck that. You know, that's bullshit. You know, I pick me, I pick my projects if I like the music, if I like the guys in the band and I like what they're doing and what they stand for. And I don't give a shit if it's going to make me money or not. You know, and I'm not rich. You know, I made a lot of records. You made a lot of money for me. But to this day, you know, that was years ago. I'm not like a rich guy, but um, I still got my equipment and I'm still making records, you know. So, uh, um, you know, 
I was out of the scene. I dropped out for about nine years. I didn't make any records. I just said, fuck this. I don't want to do this anymore. And uh, it was only after, uh, you know, seeing bands like The Shrine out there playing and other bands that I started. And people were saying to me, like, I'll tell you, one of the piece of people that got me back into was Rowan. Rowan was saying, you know, you just know so fucking much about recording. You should be doing this. Because Rowan does a lot of sessions. And he says, the people doing this shit that are producing engineering this stuff don't know jack shit you know, compared to what you know, you know? And, and, and he says, you should be doing this again. So um, that's the reason I'm, I'm going to, you know, uh, Rowan's, in fact, I was just texting Rowan today and going back and forth. I mean, Rowan has probably been my biggest supporter. And I'm Rowan's biggest supporter, too. I think he's an awesome player. I want to put a project together around him, you know. But it, it would be great. If, oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. You know, do you put together something. We, you know, Rowan doesn't sing, so it'd have to be, you know, the, the, find the right singer. But Rowan is such an awesome player. And he gets such great tones. He's such a nice guy, and he can do anything. I mean, he, he can play anything, but he, he plays that British blues stuff. Fucking, I'm, I'm a big fan of the British blues scene in the late 60s or 70s. When I was talking to him, I was struck that he almost seemed like he was too damn humble for his own good. Exactly. You, you, just, you just nailed it. Everybody <laughs> says the same thing about Ron. Yeah. Ron, I... I know people that don't have one one hundredth of the talent that they are that think that they're hot shit, you know, they got names for themselves. And Rowan is so much fucking better. And believe me, I've worked with I've worked with the best guitar players in the world. I've worked with Jimmy Page, I've worked with Jeff Beck, I've worked with uh, you know, um, Pete Townsend, you know, even though Pete Townsend may not be considered a great guitar player, he he is he has a sound. And I've, you know, I've, and I've, you know, a lot of great guitar players. Adrian Ballou was an amazing guitar player. And, and Rowan, Rowan is, is good or better than all of them. You know, I'm telling you, this guy is amazing. So uh, he, should, he should have his own thing put, put together around him. And maybe I can make that happen for him. I don't know. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. He's such a good guy. But we talk about it. We do talk about doing it. It's not like this is a big secret. Ron knows that I would do this in a second. If he came up with the right situation for himself where he had a band going or something, I, don't, I, I hate putting together bands. Like uh, I like things to grow organically. I always think like putting together an all-star band or something like that. But, you know, I consider uh, helping them find musicians to do it. And if nothing else, I'd uh, uh, get a band started and then see where it goes from there. But uh, I would call it the Rowan Robertson Project, you know, and just name it after him. But um, I, I think his time has come because, you know, he plays with everybody around town here, too. He plays, you know, like he's always playing in clubs around town here. And, and he, uh he, he, he's been playing around town with John Densmore from The Doors. And, uh, oh, God, he, he goes on and on about the people he's playing with. But uh, everybody loves his playing. But, um, so, I mean, pretty much where I'm at is uh, I'm ready to go again. You know, I got a studio downtown Los Angeles, uh, and we got a mean board. We got tape machines and plus Pro Tools, and we got all, all the right equipment. You know, all the right compressors, microphones, all lots of tons of instruments and stuff. It's in an industrial building downtown. Uh, it's a three-story building. And uh, one whole floor of it is just a recording studio where we cut drums. And then the second story is where the control room is. And we have glass that looks down into the, um, into the studio. And it's a really comfortable building. It's really, it's, it's, it, the studio is turning into kind of a scene. There's actually parties people put on events at this in our studio and people and people and it looks so cool that people do the videos there and stuff um it's just a really yeah it's a really hip place to work it sounds like that you're back now to focusing on new bands and that seems to be where the passion lies is that fair to say absolutely i'm not i'm not working with bands that already have a sound you know famous bands or whatever it's like you know I mean, I worked with Offspring, and, and um, I brought them from being like a totally punk band into being more punk rock band, and that was a real process to do. I had to, that was done over a period of two albums, Dixie and Ombre and Americana records, but they already had an audience and all that stuff. 
And I prefer to work with new bands, tiny new bands that could be anything, you know, that, that strip them down to take away all their influences, you know, even though the influences are there, but concentrate on what they're doing new. You know, do what's, what are they saying that's different, that's going to make a difference, you know? Um, uh, that That's what intrigues me. And if it's got a twist to it, you know, something that's got something dark about it, like like Nick got a Nick Cave thing to it, you know, that, that's that's something that interests me, you know. I mean, one of my favorite producers is uh, T-Bone Burnett. He does dark stuff, you know. Um, and uh, I, I like stuff that has a dark twist to it, you know, something that's, uh, you know, like crying for another another place instead of just, you know, that's the problem I have with the hair bands in the, uh, in the, uh, 80s was they, they were just like copying what was out there, you know, trying to put their own twist on it. But they were um, they weren't saying anything new. I, I like bands that are saying things new. I mean, one of my favorite all time bands is Joy Division. I remember when that band came out and changed everything. I mean, Talking Heads, everything came out in Joy Division. And uh, you know, every once in a while, there's game changing plans. I like to think a, a game changing band was Alice in Chains, you know, and also that. Uh, uh, James Addiction was a game changing plan to this day. So, you know, that, and they're both got a dark thing to them, you know. Lane and Jerry Cantrell had a dark thing to them, and I totally fit in with that. You know, and I'm not a weirdo. It's not somebody I, I'm into, like, you know, extreme bondage or something like that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean, my, my dark thing purely comes from the music and what the music is saying. It doesn't come from any kind of crazy ass lifestyle I'm living, you know. But um I mean I'm single, I live by myself, I I, I live in a one bedroom apartment in Woodland Hills. I don't live a big lifestyle. All my whole place, my is my whole world is a recording studio and uh you know you know, my apartment is filled with odd objects, but uh, that's about the worst worst I can say about my lifestyle. But um, so I'm not a you know I I I, I don't drive a Porsche I drive a John Dodge Challenger I uh, I uh, still listen to the same music I've been listening to my whole life which is uh, hard rock from the early 70s and uh, and I'm still looking for bands that do something different for me you know and uh, keep make me want to get up in the morning you know that was Dave Jordan hope you enjoyed it. Dave is up and running again with his own studio and bands can reach out to him on Facebook. He's easy to find and he's actively taking on bands again. That's it for another week on The Double Stop. Make sure you check out all the past episodes at thedoublestop.com. Until next week, I'm Brian Sword. Thanks for listening. <laughs>